you're you're not using civil war as a metaphor <laughs> and, and so like, give it give us a sense of like wh- how you think this manifests itself if uh, and 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 or a sense of how the people you spoke to and we should say like you know and and, and then i want to get to ashley babbitt too um the, which the the sort of where the title of the book comes from but um as you're talking to all these people um and it's almost an ethnography on some level. Uh, um, as you're talking to all these people, what do they, wh- what do you glean from them as to what a civil war could look like? I think they're, what they think a civil war looks like is imaginary, right? Um, uh, just there's a, a new excerpt up from the book uh, uh, up on Vanity Fair today, the guns are what matters, right? And um, there I was in Rifle, Colorado, the aptly named Rifle, Colorado, at Warren Bobert's Shooter's Grill, which is like Hooters, but with guns, uh, waitresses and cutoffs and carrying giant sidearms. And um, uh, I ended up having a lunch. Um, I mean, it's all sort of kitsch, fascism is kitsch, and I think that also confuses people. They think it's silly and funny and therefore it doesn't matter. So I had a guac nine hamburger, get it? Guacamole, mm-hmm. uh, or as they call it there, guacamole. Um, I had a guac nine hamburger with a, a, a militia man. And on the one hand, here's the good news, right? This guy is well armed. Um, and he kept saying, we're going to rise up. We're going to rise up when they come for our guns. Well, first of all, um, the Biden administration, I don't think any American government is going to come and take all the guns. Um, that's not going to happen. So great. Meanwhile, this guy believes that Democrats are actually eating children. Well, if that's not enough, to get you in the streets, maybe you're not coming out. I don't think. Uh, and with and we should just say, literally thinks that Democrats are eating children. Like uh, that, yeah. the, like like top leadership is eating. He's full like QAnon, Pizzagate, uh, whatever yeah. that uh, sort of. And he's not mentally ill and he's not stupid either. And those beliefs are common. And I almost guarantee you, wherever you are, you may not know it. It may not have come up in conversation. You know people. You may even have friends who hold these beliefs. Um, In in Wisconsin, Marinette, Wisconsin, I spent some time in the home of a leader of a militia, a fairly large militia, militia, an arsenal of guns. And he says, and that's only, you know, only the legal stuff. Um, And he was a J6er. He had was streaming footage on his TV of his own footage he'd taken at J6. Uh, when does the civil war start? He says, when the feds kick in his door. Um, but what does he imagine? These are guys who've seen Red Dawn one too many times. Right. To say one time. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, they imagine, you know, up in the hills, they imagine this heroic resistance. Some of this, I'll say, is on the left, too. Uh, I hear leftists saying, I'm not afraid of these guys because we're arming up the John Brown Gun Club. Or I hear liberals say, well, these militias are in for a surprise when... Uh, an F-16 comes. Um, and yet, I think maybe one of the most important and overlooked pieces of opinion journalism recently was in the Washington Post, three retired generals speaking to the fault lines within the military. And this is something I've reported on fairly extensively for previous books. Um, uh, it, it, where is the situation? The militia is not going to come marching. There's not going to be Red Dawn in New York or that movie, you know, Texas invades Bushwick. That's not happening. Um, uh, All these things are sparks. That's why it's a slow civil war, as the real civil war, by the way, was a slow civil war for a long time before it became a hot one. It may never blow up. Nothing is inevitable. Inevitability is is the politics of fascism. Or it may become something like Northern Ireland. Or we may get a spark where a base commander doesn't know who's really president. Do I believe Trump is president or do I believe Biden is president? Whose orders do I commit? Do I follow? Um, uh, There's enough base commanders and I've met them and interviewed them. Senior officers who are full QAnon kind of folks um, uh, for that to become a very volatile situation. The chain of command in in America is actually quite strong. That's good news. Um, But what if you don't know where the command is? Then we're looking at something far more terrifying. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think it'll happen. Um, But not because the center will hold. The center hasn't held. 
I think because we're going to slowly organize our way into something better, but we're going to have to go through a lot of that stuff first. Do you think it's generational? I mean, when you went around, um, uh, you know, and at one point you, you, you early in the book, you talk about Occupy um, yeah. and um, you, your critique is, is one that I think, you know, people have heard contemporaneously that it wasn't necessarily um, uh, organized for a specific ask. Oh, that's uh, a, oh, no, no. I thought that was the genius of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I note that. Um, so Occupy, I mean, Occupy, I put Occupy at the beginning. The, the book begins and ends with some hope. Right. So yes. That I was going to say. I was like, I couldn't, you know, I just, I couldn't stand <laughs> it, it, it did it, sort right? of feel like you didn't want to do it. Like, like, yeah. yeah. But also because I think it begins actually with uh, Occupy and with Harry Belafonte. And and like, I know this is going to cost me book sales. People are like, oh, look, I got this book and it's all about this art horrible time. I'm like, wait a minute, Harry Belafonte, the banana boat guy. Um, and the reason I put him there, I couldn't stand to start with some of the ugliness, but also um, because I want people to remember this is a long struggle. Occupy seems like a thousand years ago now, you know, when uh, it seemed like we might be on the verge of a real left shift. And remember, Occupy, as you were about to say, they famously didn't have demands, and that drove a lot of people just crazy. I thought it was brilliant, and I thought it was imagination. And right now we live in a moment where the right has, I hate to say this, more political imagination than we do. Imagination is another word like social movement. Traveling around the country, it's almost like fascist Americana folk art. I have a friend who's a Smithsonian curator. He says, we've got to collect this stuff. They are painting silos, billboards, a uh, 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 hundred different flags, 200 different flags. Um, Occupy. And artists like Harry Belfonte, who's a radical artist, the Banana Boat song, he understood that as a subversive song. The civil rights movement, he bankrolled it. It wouldn't be there almost without him. And he knows that they failed and Occupy failed. Uh, they were defeated. That's not meant to depress us. That's meant to remind us that the struggle is long, that it's not a crisis. It's not the final battle. We will lose. We keep going, um, and we need to do do so uh, with imagination and with a diagnosis that I do think is rooted in history. Harry Belafonte suggests that the way we can understand American history and race in American history is through the Minstrel Act: white men corking up, blackface. And he goes further and says there's ways in which we all do a Minstrel Act in America that this infection of whiteness. I don't mean white people. I'm a white person. I'm a person who is white, um, but whiteness, white supremacy, uh, just that's part of the undertow. And that's pulling people who would not otherwise be a part of this thing into fascism. So yeah, I think it's important to start there. Well, do you think, do you think, I mean, as you, as you travel across the country, do you think there is a, um, there's reason to believe that a lot of this is, um, generational generation yeah. um because you know i'm looking at i mean there's there was a, a poll by the wall street journal uh and um conducted with uh nork i don't know what nork is but uh at the it's a a research thing at uh at university of chicago and the 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 numbers on like patriotism and the numbers on religion from 98 to 23, particularly even in the past four years, like COVID really did a number on a lot of different things, um, are precipitous. 62% uh, said religion was very important to them in 98. And 39% and say that now. And you can, uh, I mean, uh, in addition to there being some like, obviously, uh, Democratic and Republican split, um, there's also, it's really like an age, there's a, a big age component to this. And I wonder if, you know, what we aren't seeing is sort of the white knuckle stage mm -hmm. of a lot of these things. Um, I'm, being, I'm, 50, I'm 50 and I heard that when I was 20, when I was protesting the Gulf War, when I was, uh, 
when, when the first time I was arrested for protesting the Gulf War, the old Quakers said, well, there won't be something like this in your future because your generation is going to change it. My parents heard the same thing. Before. Our generation, though, like, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, but um, I, I, I looked around and it was like, you know, Reagan and yeah. uh, PJ O'Rourke was popular. I mean, it, yeah, it looked yeah. pretty bleak to me. Oh, man, you guys are the worst. <laughs> We're about the same the same back, but yeah, the 80s are the worst. But I think, all right, there's a couple of things there. And I think those, one, I think those, I'm going to say up front, I think those numbers are some of the most dangerous numbers in America because that story is one we've been telling. And and that America is is getting more diverse. You know what else is getting more diverse? Fascism. The, mm -hmm. the, the militia churches I go to are far more diverse than the liberal churches I go to. Um, uh, uh, Trump gets this. Every rally starts with a black or brown preacher a far, far right black or brown preacher. The crowd is mostly, but not all white. Sunrise, Florida, I write about in the book. That that crowd, I don't know, maybe half white. A lot of Cubans, yes, but also a lot of Nicaraguans, a lot of Venezuelans. Uh, the Latinx boom for Trump was very real and it's not subsiding. The, the increase amongst black voters is not a boom, but it's real and it's significant. Um, so that's not going to save us. The young are not going to save us. I talked to some old people, but I start this story of, of the Ashley Babbitt story, who, by the way, is only 35, uh, in Sacramento, California at a rally, and um, which is for Ashley Babbitt, which is really a brawl between Proud Boys. Proud Boys are young. Um, the Proud right. Boys are young. The hipsters in New York, the so-called dying square scene, you know, the alt-right of New York. These are young artists. Um, there's youth everywhere but the number one reason why these numbers are wrong and why they seduce liberals and left folks into inaction is that no fascist movement has ever gained power through majority control so if you're waiting for this majority report if you're waiting for the majority to save you you're going to get swept out i'm not going to work that metaphor you really are going to get swept out. well I, no social movement has needed a majority really it seems to me to succeed you know uh, the civil rights movement was not about the right. the majority of americans by any stretch of the imagination no, it's, it's and, and when harry belfonte 19 uh 1960s he married a white woman and they because he was such a star people don't realize that he was bigger than elvis he was such a star everyone was entitled to have an opinion on that 96% of white Americans, many of them presumably who supported the civil rights movement because not 96% of white Americans were opposed to it. 96% of white Americans thought that it was wrong for him to marry a white woman, right? Um, and yet we did, <laughs> we did break down those laws, those so-called miscegenation laws. We didn't do it with a majority and fascism isn't trying to do it with a majority either. That's why the three percenters are called the three percenters. They believe that they can take back the country, as they put it, with uh, a very militant, very armed 3%. Well, That's not well, possible. Like the Republicans, up. yeah, the Republicans in general are a minoritarian party, but the fascist strain, with, strain within them, they're the most vocal, but yeah. they're even smaller than that. And I just want to return to what you were saying about the, the younger, maybe fascist uh, movement being... A little bit more multicultural the the through line though still seems to be that you know if proud boys are beating people up and they're on the younger side it's also still a very misogynistic movement and male tilted so that's what is yeah. i think a, a through line and it also connects with the new right online irony laden completely um filled with just a Many degrees of separation from humanity, irony. I said irony already, but you know what I mean. Like, that's yeah. kind of the new flavor that it's taking on. Yeah, I think I think this is also sort of where I'm using that metaphor of the undertow, which I encountered on Christian radio as I was driving up into the Colorado mountains. But um, uh, it's a little bit like I take someone like Ashley Babbitt, 35 year old white woman. Um, uh, had been a Democrat her whole life, came from a not particularly political family, but she liked to be informed. She really kind of stood up for people. She was like one of those folks who, who stands up, voted for Obama twice. And then there's this moment in her life when it's just as if she's pushing against the current of white supremacy, of misogyny, 
what if you just let yourself go? What if you just let go and let yourself flow into this hate? And then because we do have social media, why there's Andrew Tate and Joe Rogan and, and Alex Jones waiting to catch you and carry you, right? Um, there's a chapter in the book on um, the ugliest right-wing movement I've ever encountered. They're not the most powerful, uh, except in as much as they shape so much of it, the MRAs, the men's rights activists. And every other right-wing movement I've ever written about I go because they're more interesting than the liberal caricature. Um, they may be nastier, but they're more interesting. This is the only one that's dumber than his caricature, and his caricature is dumb. Um, and yet, to my horrible dismay, some of the most vocal people within that movement are the so-called honey badgers. They're the women who have embraced this misogyny too. I mean, misogyny is a disease that afflicts us all as this white supremacy. And um, I think, yes, I think, you know, when we speak of, of youth and the ways in which a lot of young people can a little bit, to borrow a term, code switch, they can sit in my classrooms, I teach at Dartmouth College, and use really appropriate and progressive and thoughtful language, and then they can click. And here, the click is usually misogyny. Um, mm. Elsewhere, it's race. Um, but waiting for the young to save us. That's not it. They've got I, to work 